So the biggest part of this job is the cleaning part. And having been cleaning these carburetors for the last 32 years, I've kind of figured out what works best for me. Putting a carburetor like this in a soaking dip is not really going to give you much of a result. Mainly because it's been sitting around, it's got a lot of debris, a lot of gasket staining, a lot of corrosion issues in it that just uh, today's dip style cleaners won't clean out. It also won't take off a lot of the gasket surface uh, debris that's stuck on here so you end up having to scrape this which creates other issues where you end up with uh, leaks and seepage because you damage the surface. So the way that I clean these is I use a vapor blast machine. You can use a glass beater and I know that brings up a lot of um, sentiment where some people feel that you cannot get out all of the blast media that can be true if you do not clean it properly so one of the biggest things that we need to do to be able to clean it properly is we have some lead plugs that are in here this one's actually fallen out uh, somebody had tried to affect a repair there earlier but we need to be able to remove these plugs to make sure that the passageways are cleaned out afterwards this is pretty much a must whenever you do these carburetors. Uh, these are the most common passageways that block up, especially on a carburetor that's been sitting around, and they are most often uncleanable without removing the plugs. To remove these plugs, I take a small drill. This one's about a two and a half millimeter, and this is soft lead. So what I generally will try to do is start the drill in, and I just do this by hand, not in a drill chuck and I want to almost make it act like a self-tapping screw and you kind of sort of feel it pop through. Once I'm through I want to try and pull back and pull the plug out. Now sometimes it'll take a little bit of work. There is a small shelf in there so you don't want to use a drill that's too big and I just want to make sure it gets in there all the way If it doesn't pop out, which this one hasn't, I mean I'm through and into the passageway, what I'm going to do is just use a small awl. And you have to be careful when you do this that you don't damage the carburetor body. But I'm just going to pry out that plug through the hole that I was able to drill through it. So there's the entire plug. Then, with the plug out, I can verify the passageway. And this one's in pretty bad shape. My drill's going in there and getting stuck instantly. This should slide all the way through. So these are definitely dirty and won't. There we go. I was able to force it through. These do get a build up in them. So even if they're not completely plugged, it can limit the amount of fuel flow and it's one of the most important areas that needs to be cleaned out. Okay, on the other end, up here is another plug and it'll be directly back from the idle air bleed and it's going to be the same lead plug and you need to pull these out as well and I'm going to do that in the same manner so I just want to get my drill hopefully this one will come out without me having to pry it out And it's doing the same thing, so I'm just going to use my awl again to pop it out of the carburetor. This one came out a little bit easier. So that's what they look like when they come out. This passageway connects on your idle jet, and it comes down inside the carburetor body, down and connects with this passageway. And this is where your fuel flow comes from, bottom of the main jet well, which is right here 
flows along this passageway, up this passageway, through the idle jet, then down this passageway you can see on the outside. Now these passageways here can be verified without pulling this plug here, mainly because you can get a good air nozzle fit into there and get good air pressure through. You can also take a cleaning nozzle and squirt it up here. Rarely have I had to pull these ones out because these are made of brass, they're not lead. This passageway cleans easily. Same with our accelerator pump passageways. These I've rarely had to pull these out on some very rare occasions when there's been a lot of corrosion. We're trying to save a high value carburetor. I've removed these. But because I have good access down here and here and they're a large passageway, I can get plenty of solvent down and flush these passageways. So for right now I've left the studs in because I'm going to blast the carburetor first. And I want to blast my studs before I send them to my plater. It's easier to deal with them when they're still installed in the body than trying to blast them in the cabinet and hang on to them. So I'll clean the body, I'll clean all the studs, then we'll pull them out and get them replated. So that's just a little tip there. So we've spoken about the body. These parts are a different material. The bodies of the carburetors are cast aluminum, and whereas these are cast zinc. So I clean these in the same manner, I just keep them separate. Uh, these components will need a lot of help because they do warp, they're fairly soft. These will get blasted and polished, the Venturis will get blasted and polished, I just keep them separate from the bodies. When it comes down to our brass, I've tried a lot of different methods for cleaning brass. When it comes to cleaning the floats, these are really delicate and about the only way you can do it effectively is using Scotch-Brite and a solution uh, on the bench and gently scrubbing. You cannot bead blast these. They are not strong enough to handle the amount of pressure that you place on them with a bead blast machine. If you do, what will happen is it will just swell up, dent, and you'll end up with a hole and a bad flow. Uh, if there's any question, I generally will replace floats. Rarely do I reuse them because they're 50 plus years old and if I send it out on a job and it fails then it's a problem for warranty. For our other components uh, what we have settled on using for about the last 8 to 10 years now is a stainless steel tumbler media. Now these are used in rock polishing or reloading. They work really well for polishing up brass. I drop it into the tumbler and it's a mix with some stainless steel rods, a little bit of soap, and some water conditioner. Let it tumble for an hour, and they'll come out looking brand new. A couple of points to remember with it. If you have passageways, like on, for example, a main jet, and the media you are using is too small, they can get stuck in the ends. So you need to block off those, and I use a rubber cap if there's something I need to block off. The other thing to bear in mind is threads can become rounded in the tumbler. You don't want to tumble them for too long. Sometimes I'll have to run a die over a part to correct the threads. And you'll see it immediately when you try and screw it into the body. It won't want to screw in even though you've cleaned the threads in the body. So the last component that we haven't touched on are the chokes. These are made of cast aluminum. You've got to be careful in the bead blaster because these are not very strong. If you put your nozzle too close it'll actually make it um, swell up like a big pimple, so you got to keep some distance. The other thing that you will find quite often is a modified choke. This is where somebody takes a choke that is too small for their requirements and instead of buying the correct choke, they'll try and machine it out larger thinking this is going to work and give them a larger choke. If you find chokes that have been machined like this, they are generally trash. The reason being is if we look on a factory choke, this one's a little dirty so it's hard to see, but we see the choke limit is very small. It chokes in and then it increases that size out. When you have a large surface area here like where this has been machined, so they've taken probably a 30 millimeter choke and tried to make it a 32, when you machine it out and you end up with this large flat surface, it changes the flow characteristics right here. Typically you want to choke 
with the choke point sitting right at the bottom of the auxiliary booster. This is how it's going to sit in the car or in the carburetor. That choke point increases the amount of vacuum on the bottom of the auxiliary booster and this starts your fuel flow. When you are sitting your choke point in such a wide area here and the air actually has got to go straight before it opens out on the other side, it changes the airspeed and it will also change how well this part will function in the car. You can machine a choke if you absolutely have to, but you need to maintain the point where it's sharpest and that's where most people go wrong. That means it needs to be remachined this direction and remachined this direction, not just straight through the center. The best way to deal with it is to take this, throw it in the trash, and buy a set of chokes that are sized exactly what you want them to be. So just one tip, when it comes to blasting small parts, these are our accelerator pump nozzles. Trying to hold these with rubber gloves and blast them is really, really hard. So usually what I do is I take some brass wire, I buy it in bulk from the hardware store, and what I do is I'll wire these pieces together. It makes it easier to handle. I can put this down on my blaster, blast away, flip it over, and then move on to the next one. So it helps in dealing with those kind of parts. So the last thing is our steel components. Now some of them, as I said on the take apart, I will just discard. So like flat washers, nylock nuts, all of those, it's cheaper to just throw them in the trash than it is to try and get them replated. Things that are unique, like these parts, which are the choke holders, our pivots for carburetors, those you can replace, they are available. And today with the cost of plating, Back when I started, you could take a bucket of plate into a plater and it would cost you $20. Now the minimum lot charge is $200 and up, depending on where you take it. So with some of this stuff, you may make the decision that it's cheaper to buy it new and just throw it away than it is to have it replated. If you're doing a complete restoration and you have a lot of parts and it's worth the minimum lot charge, then go ahead and get them replated. One thing you don't want to do is bead blast these to where you've removed all of the protective finish and put them back into a carburetor. The problem with doing that is the protective finish is there to preserve the steel, not to make it look pretty. It looks pretty as a byproduct. If you put a part that is untreated back into the carburetor and then back into service in a very short period of time, it's going to rust and then that's going to start to degrade all of your work so much faster. So it's important to use treated parts that have been either replated or replaced. So now I've got all of the plugs out of the carburetor body. You can see everything's exposed. We're going to go into our vapor blast machine and see if we can get this one cleaned up. So you can see the difference between a carburetor body that's dirty and one that's clean. See, I'm cleaning with my hose down each of the passageways. So there's our accelerator pump flow, accelerator pump flow, accelerator pump flow, and we've got our main jets. And you'll see it's coming out to our passageway there. So our passageway is clear. You see it off to the side right here. So I can verify that I have good flow, remove any of the blast media from the uh, carburetor. And this is just the first stage of rinsing. So next I want to dry it completely and I'm going to inspect it a little better. There's a lot of passageways and areas that you want to make sure you get cleaned out. So this is just kind of like the initial clean. So this is the first stage of the clean and we got it comparing to our 
uncleaned. This is what it looks like here. Now there's still, if I scrape in, there's probably still some remnants of bead blast material. But at this point now, I can start to look over the carburetor set. So, for example, this one has a problem with this thread. Someone's screwed a bolt in from the bottom. So we'll go ahead and pull that out. These carburetors, somebody has put in a solid bronze bushing on the end. And instead of allowing for the Teflon piece, these are an old way of doing it, but they're really tough on the throttle shafts. So what I'll do is I will ream this so it will take the Teflon bushing again. That way the bushing can be easily replaced and doesn't beat up on the throttle shaft. We still need to pull our studs out, but you could just kind of see the difference. So that's what it looks like down the throttle bores and down the throats before it was cleaned. And this is what it looks like afterwards. You just can't get that with a, the tank that you soak it in or a regular parts washer. Now, one word of caution. I use a fine glass bead. It is slower to clean, but it doesn't beat up the surface of the carburetor. The surface of the carburetor or the color of the carburetor will also be removed. So you need to deal with that either with a ceramic coating or have the carburetors re-anodized back to their original color. Do not use an aggressive bead blast media like aluminum oxide. If you'll do, you'll end up with a set of carburetors when you lay your thumbs on them, they'll feel like 80 grit sandpaper and they will attract dirt, dust and all kinds of nastiness. The other thing you want to be careful when you're blasting is don't put the nozzle too close to the gasket surfaces because if they are flat now and if you put your bead blast nozzle too close with an aggressive media you'll actually wear out this surface and have to machine it. So you've got to be careful when you're doing this. You can't just uh, use anything or do anything with them to clean them up. So one of the things with blasting, like here's our chokes that we've cleaned up and these are aluminum. The bead blast process opens all the pores on the material and what that means is that they'll get dirty very, very quickly. So to seal them up again, we are going to use our ceramic polisher and this is just a ceramic material. I've got more than one carburetor's worth in here so you can see it's got our auxiliary boosters, our pump diaphragm or pump block, sorry, pump faces. And we're just going to tumble this for about 15 minutes and that's going to seal them up. It's going to put a shine on them, but it's also going to make the clean last a lot longer. So we're finished doing the initial clean on all of our aluminum parts. We've got our chokes cleaned, polished, auxiliary boosters cleaned and polished. We've still got to pull out studs on the tops to send these out to color but that's pretty much about it left on the top. Still need to go through all the carburetor bodies, make sure all the threads that need to be repaired are repaired before we send them out for any more work. So now it's time to move on to the brass. So what I'm doing right now, this is our brass tumbler and this is the stainless steel meteor. And this is just little thin pieces of stainless steel rod. And to clean our brass, it's pretty straightforward. I've stripped most of it down. Just going to go ahead, drop it in, our bolts, our banjos, all of these are going to go straight in. Um, our float pivots will go straight in. And when it comes down to some of our jet components, uh, emulsion tubes, these can go straight in. Banjo bolts, we have to be careful on these because the, A, there's a check valve in there, so if you wiggle it and you can see on the back there's a little piece of lead that retains it, but you've got to be careful that nothing gets stuck up in the front of these. Usually they don't give me too many troubles. We're going to do our idle jets, those are all no problems, we'll pull those apart in a minute. Our bowl plugs, the ones that are possibly savable. And generally what I will do is clean everything, even if I'm going to replace it. And then that way I can make a decision once it's clean and I can really see what it looks like, whether or not it can be reused or is it just going to be replaced. So now I've got all my brass in my tumbling pot. I filled it up with just regular cold water and then used a super secret Dawn cleaner 
to scrub the brass and I find that that actually works about the best. So all I'm going to do is put my top on, so seal it up. There's a lot of different styles of these tumblers. They're pretty inexpensive to buy. And we'll put a link in the description where you can buy one if you want to buy them. And we're just going to let that tumble for about an hour. So now we've got all of our carburetor bodies cleaned up and our brass is tumbling, I'm going to go ahead and measure our throttle shafts. Throttle shafts will typically wear on the bottom side of the shaft more than the top side. The bottom side you can see here is pretty shiny and then as I rotate around the top side is not. That's because the throttle lever that sits on the end, when you step on the gas it pushes down so the throttle shaft wants to move down in the bowl. Now these are a, a discard for one or two reasons. One would be if it measures 7.95 millimeters or less, then I would discard it. And the other one is going to be heavy scoring. Typically in an IDTP, these throttle shafts are fairly savable. However, because somebody changed the bushings on it, I can already see there's a lot more wear. So I'm just going to go and measure these up. The first one's coming in at 7953, so this one is going to be a discard. It's right on the minimum limit. The other thing, before I even measure it, I can see how much wear there is, and I can feel it with my fingernail. So there's no point measuring any more of that. So I'm just going to grab the next one. The next one's showing the same kind of wear right here and here. Now, typically, let's just measure this one. So this one's definitely undersized, 7.93. And to give you an idea what the new shaft thickness, I'm just going to measure in the middle. You can see our shaft comes up at 8 millimeters, 8.001, so pretty damn close to 8 millimeters. But if we measure the other end, this is in the middle of the carburetor body. Let's get it on the most amount of wear. See how it has not suffered as much wear as the other end. That's because of the load being placed on the shaft. But both of these shafts will need to be replaced. And we're going to do the same with our short shafts. Okay, 7.98, that's still usable. Measure our other end. Seven point nine nine, so that shaft will still be usable. Seven point nine nine, that shaft is usable. Seven point nine eight. So our two short shafts could be cleaned up and reused if we wanted to. Our two long shafts are definitely worn out. So I'm going to clean my float. As I said, we don't want to bead blast these. We want to clean them by hand. So I'm going to use some of my super secret cleaning soap and a little bit of Scotch-Brite. Scotch-Brite will work wet or dry. And we just want to lightly work over them. Just to remove any residue, we don't have to get them to buff until they're 100% shiny. You just want to remove all of the debris from being inside the carburetor from them. Shop towel. And then dry that off. One area that we do want to pay attention to is right here. This is where the needle and seat assembly will work on the float. Sometimes if it gets a large divot from the ball bearing, we just grab the float, needle valve. So this is our needle valve right here, and this is spring-loaded. 
So as the float comes up like that, it shuts that needle valve, that shuts off the fuel, and there's some room there for it to bump. If this groove is large and you are going to plan on reusing your float, then you want to take a small piece of sandpaper and smooth that out. You just break it until you can work a little corner there. Uh, what can happen if you don't? Sometimes a needle valve can get stuck in there and it might not seal 100%. You can have some leakage. If it's a small bump like this one, I wouldn't even worry about it. I'd just go ahead and continue to use that float if I was going to use it. So another check that we want to make if the carburetor hasn't run and sometimes or you don't know anything about it, you just bought it like this set was and you're not sure if the floats are usable or any good still, what we want to do is go ahead and submerge them in our cleaning tank. Now the float should pop straight back up, but we're looking for any bubbles that are going to rise to the surface. I've got my detergent water that I'm using for cleaning so I can see the bubbles will really stand out. Now once it's been held under fluid for a while, pull it out and shake it. If you feel any liquid inside the float at all, then that float is no longer usable and needs to be thrown away. So if the floats have been in service and you've just pulled this off the car and you're experiencing some issues and you want to check the float condition, then another way is to weigh the float. They are marked with their weight. These should be 25.5 grams. So I've just got my scale. I'm going to go ahead and set it on. This one comes in at 24.7. I use as an acceptable area a plus or minus a half a gram. So this float is a little bit on the light side, but that also means that it hasn't sucked up any fuel or there's no gum or sludge inside the float itself. So you could go ahead and reuse that. If you ended up with one that was heavier, that would indicate that there is material inside the float, in which case I would discard it immediately. So our brass has been tumbling for about an hour and a half, and I'm just going to take a look, see how it's doing. It's nice and bubbly. Not too bad. Could still go a little bit longer. Look at some of the other pieces. The dirtier the brass is, the longer it needs to go. It's still got some tarnish on it. Is we'll drop this back in and let it go for another hour or so. So I just pulled these out after running them for a little bit longer. They look much better. So I'm going to go ahead and drain the rest out. We'll clean and dry it. Just air it off with compressed air. But that's pretty shiny. I'm pretty happy with that. These are ready to go off to plate or color or whatever uh, you're going to decide to do, but there's a few things we need to look at first. Any machine work needs to be done before the coloring process because you don't want to be doing it after the coloring process. So I'm going to take my straight edge. This is a uh, starret. It's not just a ruler. And I want to look at my gasket surfaces. And this is just a standard crisscross pattern and make sure that everything's flat. You can put a 2000s feeler gauge under there if you want or you can feel it or just hold it up to the light. So I want to check that on all surfaces. Now usually on these gasket surfaces I will lightly sand using our 80 grit on a piece of glass just to make sure there's no high spots around here. I've also already tapped all of our holes right here so these, this one's pretty much ready to go out. It's a little rough on the top, so I'll probably dress that lightly. When it comes down to the bodies, we want to have a good look in at our throttles. So what we're looking for is any signs of excessive corrosion or wear from the throttle plates. So if this is a lot of wear, and I'll show you a body in just a second that does, then that needs to be corrected first and the way that we would correct that would be to overbore this to an oversized throttle plate and make a custom throttle plate. To give you an idea of what something looks like that's in really bad shape, 
So this IDA body has a lot of wear. We can see here where the throttle plate has worn into the actual body. There's also a lot of corrosion around this area here. Now a lot of times these will wear in because the throttle shaft will bounce when it's at idle when the bushings wear out and that'll cause that shaft to wear into the housing. And we can also see it on this one here. It doesn't have the corrosion but has a very distinctive line. To correct this it needs to be overboard and a custom throttle plate needs to be made. So once I've done checking all of these components, move them over to the side. Next thing I want to look at is my brass and not even getting into the jet size of things just yet but first thing I want to do is look at the condition. Now this idle jet has been over tightened so many times and I can see it has a distinct mushroom on the jet. This jet is trash. We would just not even bother reusing it. What happens when a jet is over tightened and pushed into the housing, so this is going to come in right here, and the jet holder pushes in from the back side like that. Once this distance is worn down like this one is, it will not have a good seal on this surface around here. So you run the risk of fuel leaking past the calibrated orifice, in which case you have no control over how much fuel is coming in. So the overall condition of the jet needs to be looked at first. And like these are uh, trash, so we just throw those away. If the jet was not trashed, we would then go to pin fit the jet. So on the jet there should be a size marked and these are 55's. So that means it should take a 0.55 jet pin gauge down through this nozzle. So I'm just going to grab 0.55 which goes in and fits very nicely. I can feel a slight drag. Now, because these carburetors are 50 years old and have seen who knows how many mechanics, I will say the majority of jets that I pull out of carburetors are not the size that they are marked. And you need to pin fit it to see exactly what size you have. Very important part of rebuilding. The other thing you want to make sure is that all six jets are the same size. I'll, I'd say probably 80% of the carburetors that I do have multiple size jets in them. And that's because the writing is hard to read. Sometimes a jet is marked the same size, but it's being drilled by somebody else. So it's always important that all six are the same size. Next, we're going to do the same on our main jets. Now, these main jets, somebody has already modified them. And the way that I know that is they have at least done us the courtesy and have ground off the jet size. Normally we would have a size marking on the jet right there. So I have no idea what size jets these are. So I just look at it and take a guess. They're probably 130s or so, somewhere around there. So all I'm doing is I'm just narrowing down to see what jet size we have. Okay, so 51 thousandths is a little on the loose side, but 52 thousandths will not go in. So when I convert the 51 thousandths to metric, that's 1.29 millimeters, so pretty much a 130. So I'm just going to go and check all the other sizes and see if they're in the same, same place or are different. Okay, this one's really loose. Yeah, and a 52 will go in on this one. So this jet is actually bigger than that jet. Also loose. So when we look at stuff like this, we go that A, we have different sizes. So that means different fuel flows. Also, a jet, when you drill a jet, it changes the length inside the jet. You can see it's tapered on here. And then in the back side, it's counterboard. When you increase the size across here, it changes the fuel flow characteristics. The only time you should ever drill a jet is when you're doing some rough tuning and you want to get into the ballpark area of where your main jet needs to be. Once you find a rough size, then you always want to switch to non-drilled jets. They will have different flow characteristics. So even though it pin fits at 130, it may have a flow characteristic of a 125 or a 128 or a 132 you just 
don't really know. So these would also be a discard. So we're going to do the same for our air correctors. Air correctors have their size marked on them. But once again, in a 50 year old carburetor, never believe what it's marked. Always want to pin fit it. These are marked at a 180 on the size. Usually very few people will drill these. So I have found them drilled before. So you always want to check them. Now, most times if these are not too tore up, you can reuse as long as this slot isn't really beat up. What will happen if you put it back in and you can get it back in when everything is clean and tight, that's great. But a couple of years from now when everything's corroded over, if it's all broken out, there's a good chance that this will break off in the top of the carburetor. Brass does age and when you have 50 year old brass in a carburetor, you don't want it snapping on you when you're doing a routine maintenance. So if anything looks like it's damaged on the top, just go ahead and replace it. These are not expensive. Okay, these are our bowl plugs and these screw into the bowl of the carburetor. These are probably one of the biggest items that I see that snaps. And if we have a good look at this one, we can see how the hole is on an angle like this. And that's because somebody has screwed this in and when they've tightened it down, they've cranked the head down and the body or the thread of the plug couldn't screw in anymore. So what happened was just the head talked. This is waiting to snap. I would never put this part back in. Uh, most of them show signs, some worse than others. This one's not too bad. You could reuse it, but you can see it's starting to go on an angle. But most of the ones that came out of this carburetor had been over -talked. So that's something to, to look for. The same with your main jet holders. If there's any signs of corrosion around these areas, this is where they will tend to snap because you'll screw them down in. You'll give them that extra tweak to kind of tighten them into the body and they'll snap right through these holes. So if you see any signs of twisting in this part of the body, you want to go ahead and replace these as well. Last thing to look at is emulsion tubes. These really do not wear. So the only thing that you're looking for is the size and that'll be marked on the bottom of the emulsion tube. They are really hard to see. Sometimes you got to get a magnifying glass on them. This is part of your jet package and that's something that we talk about when we go and put the carburetor together. Choosing an emulsion tube is an important part of the tuning process. It's also one of the hardest parts of the carburetor to tune. So all we're really looking for on these is making sure uh, that there's no blockage. These are an F3, which means the bottom is closed. Uh, on others, you'll have an open bottom like an F26 or an F1. So you want to make sure that you can go through them. With these, I use a thin piece of wire. Make sure I can get all the way to the bottom. Just make sure all the holes are clear. And that's about all you need to do on those. Well, that wraps it up for our disassembly and cleaning. Now these carburetors will go off to our color. Uh, we'll figure out a jet package for it. And we'll just move on to the reassembly once everything, uh, once these come back from the colorization process.